A new answer for methane on Mars. Bepi Colombo is having thruster problems. Three of the oldest stars in the universe are right nearby and the best auroras in decades. All this and more in this week's Space Bites. I'm back from Japan. What an amazing trip. I am completely exhausted, so I blame any problems in this video on my jet lag. One of the most surprising discoveries from the Curiosity rover on Mars was that it was detecting the presence of methane around it. And there shouldn't be sources of methane on Mars, and yet there it is. Now on Earth, methane is produced by bacteria and burping cows and some other organic sources. But you can also get methane from inorganic. It can happen from volcanism as well. And so scientists were wondering, like, where is this methane coming from on Mars? And this mystery has deepened because the levels of methane have increased dramatically, sometimes by like a factor of 20. It appears seasonally and then disappears on other seasons. It sometimes only shows up at night. And many different ideas have been proposed. Obviously, the most exciting one is that there's some kind of bacteria that's producing methane on Mars and then it is going out. But the fact that it fluctuates so wildly is a really weird one. And so scientists were trying to think about this. And one thing they noticed is that the methane sometimes appears after Curiosity has just finished moving. And they thought, wait a minute, could Curiosity be causing the methane? They only found this methane in Gale Crater. It was only coming from around the Curiosity rover, which, you know, seems like a smoking gun. And so what they looked at was what could there be under the surface of Curiosity as it is rolling along? And they realized that there could be a thin layer of salt produced by the perchlorates in the regolith on Mars. And as Curiosity rolls across this salt area, it sort of cracks the seal, presses it down, and any methane that is trapped underneath the regolith can then escape and form this cloud around Curiosity. It's some kind of fart joke here, but I haven't really been able to put it together. But what is the source of that methane? Well, that's still a mystery. So there could be some bacteria underground that's producing methane. There could be some inorganic process, some volcanic process that's producing the methane. It's building up in a layer underneath this salt layer. And then as Curiosity is rolling across, it's pushing it down, cracking the seal, you get the methane release. And of course, it's detecting methane all around it. Uh, it's a great idea. I really love it. Who knows if this is the right one to explain the methane mystery on Mars. Bepi Colombo is having problems with its thrusters. So this week we learned that the European Space Agency's Bepi Colombo mission is having a problem with its solar electric thruster. It has an ion engine on board. It's gathering electricity from the sun, then fires this ion thruster for long periods of time to do a very huge delta V over time, but it's not a very strong thruster. And so it works in the background, putting it into the right trajectory to be able to make its way down to Mercury. And what it has to do is a series of flybys, bunch of gravitational slingshots. But instead of speeding it up, it's going to be slowing it down and putting it into an orbit so that it can actually reach Mercury later on. And so engineers at ESA discovered that the thruster was having problems. They troubleshot, they worked with it for a while, and they were able to get it back up to about 90% of the thrust levels that it's supposed to be putting out. The area of the spacecraft that is having this problem is called the transfer module. And in fact, there's two separate orbiters that are attached to the transfer module. And when it arrives at Mercury, it will detach, they'll ditch this transfer module, and then the two orbiters, one from Europe, one from Japan, will go into orbit around Mercury. And so really, this transfer module only needs to last long enough to be able to fulfill this part of the mission. Now, spokespeople at the European Space Agency said that they've got an upcoming flyby and with the thrust they're able to get out of the thruster, they're going to be able to make this flyby, probably make the next couple. And then once it's completed those flybys, it'll ditch the transfer module. It's going to use a chemical rocket to do its final insertion burn at Mercury. So this is definitely a problem uh, and they're going to keep an eye on it and hopefully be able to work through it in time to be able to complete the mission and actually get into orbit at Mercury. Three of the oldest stars in the universe are circling the Milky Way. So the Milky Way is a modern evolved galaxy. It is filled with population one and two stars. Of course, this is backwards, but population one stars, stars like the sun, very modern. They've 
got a lot of elements in them that are left over from the deaths of other stars. We are sort of the result of all of these other stars putting out their material into the universe. Population two stars, these are older, these have less of these heavier metals inside of them and were formed earlier on in the universe. But now astronomers have found three stars that appear to be almost as old as the universe itself. They are just have very low levels of metals in them, mainly hydrogen and helium, and then trace amounts of other elements in them. And these stars are not in the main rotating disk of the galaxy, they are orbiting around the halo about 30,000 light years from Earth. And so astronomers think that these were part of some ancient dwarf galaxy that was absorbed by the Milky Way early on in its history. And the stars in that galaxy formed 12 to 13 billion years ago, really when the universe was just in its first billion or so years of life. And yet we still got some of these ancient stars orbiting around in the Milky Way. Just to be clear, these are different from that first generation of stars, the population three stars that are made of that primordial hydrogen and helium that'll have almost no heavier elements in them at all. Nobody has found direct evidence for those yet, but indirect evidence has been found. Solar storms, auroras everywhere. And what a weekend. Uh, we got some of the most powerful solar storms coming off the sun in decades. No less than six coronal mass ejections were blasted directly towards the Earth from a bunch of X class flares. So we just got solar storm after solar storm hitting the planet. And that meant auroras and like auroras to really southern latitudes, people as far south as Florida, Alabama, California, uh, places in Europe, people in Australia were seeing auroras. Now, I was in Japan. And we should have seen auroras at the latitude that I was at, but we had cloudy skies. And so I didn't see it. But it was funny because I was on the phone with my wife, she spent the whole night outside hours taking pictures and watching auroras. I'll show you some of the pictures that she got and keep in mind, these are just pictures that she took from her phone. It's unbelievable. And of course, we had hundreds of people share their pictures on the universe today Flickr page where we often will share pictures over on universe today. And so it's just incredible. Um, I'm going to talk more at the end of this episode about how you can see an Aurora if you really want to. Every week, we do a vote on our channel where you tell us what you thought was the tastiest space bite. And uh, this week, the winner was new evidence for planet nine. So thank you everybody who voted. Now we will post a new vote into our community tab on YouTube within about 24 hours of when we release this video. So go ahead, go there, vote. If you're just scrolling on your phone, you should see the vote pop up and you can vote there. Of course, the best chance is to subscribe to our channel, click on the notifications bell and watch a bunch of our videos. And then that'll train the YouTube algorithm to know that you want to see more of our stuff, including this all important weekly vote. Supermassive black holes started from giant cosmic seeds. Astronomers know that there are supermassive black holes at the hearts of pretty much every galaxy in the universe. We've got one here at the heart of the Milky Way, and we've seen the evidence of many of these other supermassive black holes. These are black holes with millions, sometimes billions of times the mass of the sun. And thanks to telescopes like James Webb, we know that these supermassive black holes were already in galaxies within the first couple of billion years at the age of the universe. Now, you can't detect the black holes themselves, but you can detect them as quasars. This is when the supermassive black hole is actively feeding on material around it. And then that material is piling up in an accretion disk around the black hole. Magnetic fields are firing out these jets out into space. And so you look under the universe, you see these bright star like objects. These are the jets coming from these supermassive black holes. But the problem is that the jet then overwhelms the brightness of the rest of the galaxies. It's the same problem as why we can't see planets around other stars. The star is too bright. In this case, the quasar is too bright. You can't learn very much about the galaxy. But James Webb is able to use a coronagraph to be able to dim the light from the quasar. And so it was able to do this and then be able to reveal details about the galaxy around the black hole. And what they found is that these early black holes can still be 50 million times the mass of the sun. So that's like 10 times more massive than the Milky Way's black hole. And yet they're about 
10% of the mass of their galaxy and compare that to our black hole, which is only about 1% of the mass of the Milky Way. So we still don't know what is the source of these supermassive black holes, what caused giant black holes to grow so quickly. But it really appears that earlier on in the universe, the black holes were a larger component of their galaxies than they are today. A star became super bright. And now we know why. In 1937, astronomers noticed that the star Fu Orionis became about a 1000 times brighter in the sky. And this was a mystery and they didn't know what caused this brightening. And in fact, they've gone on to find other stars that have had the same process. And now they give them this generic term Fu Ori. I know it's hilarious, right? Fu. So why did this star brighten by a factor of a 1000? Well, we've got a few clues. So one is that the star is only about 2 million years old. So it's very young, which means it is probably still pulling in gas and dust and creating material so that it can actually complete its star formation. And so astronomers used ALMA, the Atacama Large Millimeter Array, and they were able to observe the region around Fu Orionis. And they were able to see that there is this accretion disk around the star. And so what they think is happening is that gas and dust is falling down into this accretion disk, it builds up a bit and it becomes unstable. And then some of this material then gets closer to the star, heats up, causes this flash. And then over time, as that material gets absorbed, gets burned up, it then settles back down and then the process continues again. So still no concrete explanation for exactly what's going on. But it has something to do with the accretion disk around this young hot star. Now I want to share two amazing images from the Hubble Space Telescope. You know, James Webb gets all the love, but Hubble is still a phenomenal telescope and produces just some amazing images. So the first is a lenticular galaxy. And this is NGC 4753. And this galaxy, you're seeing it kind of edge on and then there's this almost like wispy cotton candy, like strands of material surrounding the galaxy. And so what astronomers think happened is that a dwarf galaxy was consumed by NGC 4753 and torn apart into these strands of material that are then surrounding the galaxy. It's really cool. And second image is of a T Tauri star. It's actually a triple star. So three stars together. It's designated HP Tau. And then the second star is HP Tau G2 and then HP Tau G3. And so these three stars are all very young, probably within the first 10 million years of age. And they're putting out intense radiation, which is then striking the nebula material around them and blowing it out, creating this giant cavity around these three stars. And yet also this radiation is heating up the material. You're seeing the reflected light off of the stars in the nebula material, which makes it glow in this sort of blue color, a uh, beautiful image and sort of tells us a lot about the earliest stages of stars. Now we cover a bunch of stories here on Space Bites every week. But in fact, we're covering many more stories over on Universe Today. And I write them up as a weekly email newsletter, which then you can get more information on our website. So for example, here are three stories that you're not going to get on Space Bites, but you will get in the newsletter. Astronomers try to directly observe an exoplanet at Epsilon Eridani, but no luck. A field of rocks that was formed in an ancient lake on Mars seen by curiosity. And maybe clashing galaxies create this weird thing called odd radio circles. Now, as you're watching this video right now, I am just wrapping up the latest episode of the newsletter and I am then going to send it out to more than 70,000 people. The newsletter is completely ad free. You can unsubscribe anytime you want and I write every word inside of it. So if you want more space news from me and the team at Universe Today, go to universetoday.com slash newsletter to sign up. All right, I'm going to talk more about maximizing your chances of seeing an Aurora. But first, I'd like to thank our patrons. Thanks to Abe Kingston, Andrew Gross, Dennis Alberti, Dougie Stewart, Dustin Cable, Jeremy Mattern, Jim Burke, Jordan Young, Josh Schultz, Mark Anstis, Modso, Paul Rohrbach, Stephen Krasaki, Stephen Filer Munley, and Vlad Shiplin, who support us at the Master of the Universe level, and all of our other supporters on Patreon. So I missed this latest batch of Aurora's, but I've seen them in the past and they are mind blowing. And I think for a lot of people out there, they saw Aurora's for the first time. And then there's probably a bunch of you that are watching this right now who live in the parts of the world that saw Aurora's, but you didn't see them. 
and you're wondering how you can see them next time to not miss this opportunity. Now, that solar storm that just happened was the best in probably 20 years. And so we don't know if we're going to get another set of solar storms as good as what we just had. But we are approaching solar maximum on the sun, it's probably going to happen next year. So we're going to see more frequent Aurora activity leading up until we reach that solar maximum and on the other side of it. So for the next couple of years, it's really good Aurora season. So here's how to maximize. So the first thing is keep an eye on the space weather, understand what is the level of space weather that needs to be happening for you to be able to see auroras roughly in your area. And the next thing is have a place that you can go to to be able to watch the auroras. You want a place that gives you a view if you live in the northern hemisphere to the north. If you're in the southern hemisphere a view to the south, you want to be able to have as dark skies as possible to get the best Aurora experience. And then you want to find some kind of Aurora alert application. There are apps you can put on your phone. There are websites that will send you an email when the geomagnetic activity in your area has reached the point that you could see auroras. Now I don't have any recommendations, they, they come and they go. Uh, so just like do some searching to find something that will give you that kind of alert. And then the last part, and this is maybe the hardest is you have to commit, you have to say, Okay, there is a high level of aurora activity, there is a chance that I can see them, I'm going to go to the place where I'm going to try to watch them. And most likely, I'll see nothing but maybe I'll see one of the most incredible things that I've ever seen in my whole entire life. And so it's a risk, but it can really pay off. All right, good luck to all of you as we approach solar maximum. We'll see you next week.